Hi guys, so welcome to or welcome back to my channel. Um, I've decided as my channel is very new, I want to start a new series called True Crime Tuesday as when I'm watching YouTube I often gravitate towards people like Helen O'Neill and true crime stories as I find them very interesting. So I thought I'd do some UK based ones that aren't very well known or they probably are very well known, but that I've not seen very many people covered. So the first episode of this series is going to be on John Thomas Straffen, and I hope you enjoy it. Into the video. So John Thomas Straffen was born on the 27th of February, 1930, Borden Camp in Hampshire, as this is where his dad was stationed as he was a British Army soldier. He's the youngest of three siblings. His older sister was regarded as high grade mental defective uh, and she actually died in 1952 that's important because it links on to further what happens in his life um, at the age of two his father got stationed abroad so they moved to India for six years um, but after six years his father retired from the army and uh, they moved back to England and they moved to Bath in March of 1938 just seven months later, he was referred to a child guidance child guidance clinic for stealing and truancy, which is missing school. I don't know what it is. I had to search it up. Um, and in June of 1939, he was sentenced for two years for stealing a girl's purse. He was sentenced two years of um, probation, not in actual jail, because obviously he's still very young. Just like his sister, remember I said it'd come more into the story. He was regarded as a mental de mental defective as his um, probation officer found that he didn't know right from wrong and he didn't understand why he'd been sentenced to two years of probation and as his mom was looking after the, his other siblings she didn't really have time to do it so his probation officer took him to a psychiatrist which deemed him as mental mental defective. Um, in 1940, a report was done on Straffen that found he had the IQ of 58, meaning his mental age was only about six. So this resulted in him being sent to a, um, a residential school for mentally defective children called St. Joseph School. Just two years after that, he moved to senior school called Bestford Court. And he was described by the staff that worked there as a solitary boy who took correction very badly. At the age of 14, he was suspected of killing by strangling two geese. And further into this story, you'll find that more things like this happen because it's a very common trait of killers that in their childhood, they've been noted by other people for killing animals and small things like that, such as insects and just having a generally aggressive behaviour at a younger age. At the age of 16, he had another test carried out by the school that found his IQ to be 64 and he had the mental age of nine and a half. So therefore he was recommended to be discharged as he was normal age to think for himself. Um, he returned into, to Bath in March of 1946, but he was still found mentally defective. He had several failed attempts at short term jobs, but he finally got a job as a, as a machinist in a clothing factory, which he was allowed to keep. But this didn't stop him from going into houses that were unoccupied so when no one was home and stealing small items but he never took the small items home it was never about stealing them still to this day no one's quite sure why he did it he used to steal small items and then he'd just hide them he didn't give them to any of his friends because he didn't have any friends at this point and he didn't take them home with him, they could never be found. In July 1947, Straffen assaulted a 13-year-old girl by putting his hands over her mouth and said, what would you do if I killed you? I have done it before. This, was not, this wasn't this was linked to him until six weeks later when it was found that Straffen had, killed, had strangled to death five chickens that belonged to the girl's father. He was arrested for the strangling of the five chickens in which he Great, gratefully, what's the word? He um, gladly admitted to other crimes not linked to him, such as burglary of stealing the small items and the assault of a 13 year old girl. He was remanded and the medical health of Horton Hospital determined him to be mentally retarded. 
On the 10th of October 1947, he was admitted to Hawthorne Colony, which is in Bristol, and it specialises in training mentally disabled offenders into reintegrating them into society to make it easier for them, so that they understand a bit more. He was described as not violent or dangerous by the staff and other inmates there. He also isolated himself from all of the inmates and never really spoke to any of them. This good behaviour resulted in him being transferred to a lower grade security hostel um, in Winchester. He did really well and didn't offend or anything like that, but then he stole a bag of walnuts. I don't know. Um, so he was transferred back to Hawtham in February of 1950. In August of the same year, he got in trouble as he went home without authorisation and resisted the police when they went to go and um, capture him again to bring him back. Um, in 1951, he had an EEG, which is a method of recording electrical activity in the brain, which found that he, ha he suffered wide and severe damage to the cerebral cortex, probably from an attack of encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain in India before the age of six. After this point, he was considered rehabilitated enough so that he could go back home for unescorted home leaves. So then he got a market garden job. And on his 21st birthday, under the health, the Mental Health Act, I think it is, he uh, had to have another assessment. Um, it, this assessment resulted in him his certif certification being continued for the next five years, which the family then appealed. They won this appeal and the medical health, medical officer of, for health for Bath examined him and on the 10th of July, 1951, found his mental age to be 10. So they renewed his certificate for six months with the view that by the end of the six months, if he'd improved even more, then it would be written off. In one of the sources that I read, which was a book, called The Trial of John Thomas Strathern, which is in the Notifiable British Trial series, written by Letitia Fairfield. It states that he had a smouldering hatred and intense resentment for the police. On July 10th, that was the day of Strathern's appealed assessment, which deemed him to only have his certification renewed for six months, a little girl called Christine Butcher was strangled to death and he saw the press coverage. This according to the book, allowed Strathern to link the two that a young girl being strangled to death caused the police the most amount of trouble. So on the 15th of July 1951, Strathern was on his way to the cinema when his route took him down Camden Crescent in Bath, where he saw five-year-old Brenda Goddard picking flowers, where he offered to show her a better place. He lifted her over the fence and when he lifted her over, she fell and hit her head on the rock. Then she was unconscious, to which Strathern strangled her to death and then just left the body. Didn't try to hide it, didn't do anything with it. He just walked, went to the cinema, saw shock proof and then returned home as if nothing had happened. Due to Strathern's extensive history with mental health problems, the police actually did suspect Strathern and on the 3rd of August, he was questioned by the police. But meanwhile, the police questioned his employer, to which, for some unbeknown reason, I don't know why, because obviously he wasn't at work, allowed the police to dismiss him from the case and say that he wasn't a suspect anymore. On the 8th of August, whilst at the cinema, Strathern met eight-year-old Cicely Batstone, I hope I'm saying that right, and he took her to another cinema where they watched another film and then got on a bus to Tumps, which is, I believe that's how you say it, which is a meadow on the outskirts of Bath, where he then strangled her to death. As obviously there was in very public area before the murder took place, there was many witnesses, such as the bus driver, as he recognised Strathern as an old work colleague. A couple who was on the meadow that took a good look at Strathern as it was very unusual for him to be with a little girl. And there was a policeman's wife in the meadow that day who mentioned it to her husband and then guided the police to the spot where they sadly found eight-year-old Cicely's body and her description, the woman, the policeman's wife's description of Strathern 
was enough to incriminate him as they knew that he was more, li more than likely responsible for it. On the 9th of August, just the day after Cicely's death, the police went to Strappan's house to arrest him, where he admitted to killing her and he also admitted to the killing of Brenda. He said, the other girl, I did the same. On October 1951, Strephon's trial began and the only witness being the medical officer of Hallfield Prison, Dr Par Peter Park, who explained Strephon's medical history and described him unfit to plead. The judge said, in this country, we do not try people who are insane. You might as well try a baby in arms. If a man cannot understand what is going on, he cannot be tried and agreed that he was unfit to plead. Therefore, he was transferred to Broadmoor Hospital and was given the role of a cleaner. But that's not the end. On the 29th of April 1952, just six months after he was admitted, whilst on cleaning duty, he asked one of the supervisors or the guards if he could go outside and shake his duster. He went into the small yard and waited for all the other patients to go inside. He then climbed on the roof of a small shed that was in the yard and jumped over an 11 foot wall. He planned this and had his normal clothes under his uniform so that he could take his uniform off once he had escaped and just blend into normal society and no one would recognise him. After escaping, he came across a private drive and asked the woman who was doing her gardening if he could have a glass of water. Funnily enough, they then explained how close Broadmoor was to them and the likelihood of people being able to escape from there, which obviously he had just escaped from there. An hour and a half later, around five o'clock, he saw five-year-old Linda Bauer cycling in the nearby village. Half an hour later, she was dead. Straffan then asked another woman for a cup of tea, which she gave to him and then offered to give him a lift to the bus stop. Whilst in the car and on the way to the bus stop, he saw some men. He asked the woman, are they police officers? To which she responded, yes. This panic strapping, causing him to get out of the car and start running. She was very confused by this. So she pulled over and she spoke to the men that were clearly searching for something and explained the strange behaviour of this man that she didn't know and was just taken to the bus stop. They, they knew straight away that it was Straffin and he was caught minutes later. On the drive back to Broadmoor, Straffin stated, I have finished with crime. Linda's body was found the next morning. The police went to interview him and he said, I didn't kill her, which the inspector replied with, I didn't mention anyone being killed. Straffin then responded with, I know what policemen are. I killed two little children, but I did not kill this girl. The police officer then explained that a girl had been killed near where Straffin had been recaptured. He said, I did not kill, kill the girl on the bicycle. This then incriminated him, as how else would he know that there was a girl on a bicycle that was killed? On the 1st of May, he was charged and sent to HMP Brixton, as the magistrate said that Broadmoor had failed to hold him, so he needed to be kept in a prison until he could be tried. The Ministry of Health wanted a full inquiry as to how he escaped, as this was supposed to be a very, very secure institution. The locals had a meeting to call for, for a public warning system so if that any other prisoner then escaped from Broadmoor they would have a way of knowing and then wouldn't be in danger themselves. Due to this a warning system of sirens was set up later in 1952. Straffan's trial started on the 31st of July however after just two days the jury had to be adjourned and had to restart with a new jury as one of the members of the jury went into a political club and said to the attendants of the people there that he was on the jury and that Straffan was not guilty and that one of the prosecutor's witnesses was actually in fact the murderer of Linda. In the second trial, after just one hour of deliberation, Straffan was found guilty, to which he appealed on two different accounts. The first was that the Bath murders were wrongly admitted as they were used in the case but the judge accepted them as credible evidence. The second, after that failed, that the statement that he said on the morning when the police came and spoke to him said that it was wrongly admitted as he had not been cautioned before he had said that. 
Both of these were dismissed by the judge and the jury. So on the 4th of September was set for his execution date as he'd been sentenced to death. However, on the 29th of August, the Home Secretary, David Maxwell Fife, recommended to the Queen that Straffan be reprieved. However, in 1956, Straffan was moved to Hawfield Prison as there was an escape attempt and they was planning on taking Straffan as a decoy to deter them from the people that had really escaped as he was deemed more dangerous. The news caused extreme concern in Bristol and a petition was signed which had 12,000 signatures within weeks to, move, to remove him from Bristol. While in Hawfield, Straffan was described by a former politician, Peter Baker, who was also a fellow prisoner, as always being conspicuous whilst exercising, being much taller and always wearing distinctive clothing. He described him as a long, emaciated, miserable figure which looked like a dying butterfly or a caged animal and reported rumours that Straffan made applications to the governor every month to see when his release date would be. In August 1958, Straffan was moved to Cardiff Prison when the reg re regime at Hawfield was changed to a more liberal one. However, he reported to have been transferred back in June 1960. A new 28 cell high security wing at Parkhurst prison was built and ready for opening in 1966. The Home Secretary did not deny the rumours that he had been transferred, he was actually the first arrived and was followed by the six of the great train robbers. In May 1964, Streffen was then moved to Durham prison and was placed in the top security E-wing. Streffen was joined by a fellow child killer, Ian Brady. Crime author Jonathan Goodman wrote that the shambling lunatic, referring to Straffan, is pr in prison only because no mental institution is secure enough to guarantee his confinement. Many years later, a prison officer recalled seeing Straffan circling, banging on the fences every couple of minutes, and that one of the fellow officers described him as aloof and hostile. He never talked unless he was asked for something, always on his own. Straffan was still in Durham Prison in January 1984 when Kenneth Barlow was released after serving 26 years for murder, at which point he was the longest serving prison, pr British prisoner, which then led Straffan to be the longest serving British prisoner. Although it said that he did appeal to the governor every single month, there was no way that any occupant of the office was ever going to let Straffan out. And in 1994, Michael Howard decided to compile a list of 20 prisoners serving life sentences who would never be released. And Straffan's name was on there, as it was published by the News of the World in December 1997. And it confirmed that Straffan would never, ever get out. In 2001, with the 50th anniversary of Straffan's imprisonment approaching, his solicitors wanted his case to be reopened on the grounds that he was not fit to stand trial. During this time, investigation journalist Bob Lothinden, I think that's how you say it, examined his medical history and discovered that Straffan had been reprieved after a majority of doctors examined him and found that he was insane and this was accepted by all of them. Woffenden also doubted whether or not Straffan was guilty for the murder of Linda because Straffan had no fingernails and there was a lot of injuries seen on the body of Linda that would be caused by fingernails. Also, a lot of the locals placed Linda's murder at the time after he was recaptured. However, Straffan's application to the Criminal Cases Review Commission was turned down in December 2002. In May of 2002, the European Court of Human Rights decided a case brought by a life sentence prisoner which challenged the authority of the Home Secretary to refuse to release him after the parole board recommended he be freed. This was an opportunity for Straffan's release, who had been in Longlarton Prison since 2000, as the court decided that no politician should interfere with life sentences and therefore this was an unlawful practice. However, he was never released. And on the 19th of November 2007, aged 77, Straffan died at Franklin Prison in County Durham. He had been imprisoned 
for a British record of 55 years. The only other person who has broke this record is Ian Brady, who had been imprisoned since October 1965, 10 years after Strappan's death, Ian Brady died, making him the longest serving British prisoner. So that's it. That's the case of John Thomas Strappan. Please let me know your opinions down below, whether you like this case, whether you didn't, whether you think that this should be a series or not anyone that you would like me to cover, any cases that you're familiar with within the UK or elsewhere that you'd like me to do so you could get a bit more information on. So yeah, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment and I'll see you next time. Bye!